Welcome to the 74th episode of the Online Tennis Podcast. Thank you for joining us for this ATP final special. Today we are joined by Mr. John Silk and Mr. Owen Lewis. John, starting with you, how are we? Not bad. Um, Of course, it's also more or less the end of the tennis season. I know we've got the Davis Cup happening sort of just about right now, but if, if sort of officially it is done, singles, you know, doubles, etc. if you like. Yeah, quite right. It's a, it's a bit sad at the same time, you're right, but hopefully this is a, quite a nice note to, to end on, a, a good discussion about it and a, a decent tournament. Of course, Owen, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm doing well. Having a minor existential crisis with no no more tennis, uh, but yeah, uh, it's a fun tournament, so excited to get into it. We've got the Davis Cup, right? That's true. Yeah, and there, there'll still be some big matches there, by the way. But yeah, today it's all about the ATP Finals. We're going to go over everything Djokovic did throughout the week. Obviously, a great, great run for him, one of the biggest titles for a little while. We well, obviously Wimbledon, but besides that, uh, and Casper Ruud making the final, a little bit on Rublev. Should we feel sad? Should we feel happy for him? Improvements to make for Steph, Sitsipas, talking a bit about Medvedev and Rafa, and then, of course, Felix and Fritz rounding up the lineup. But we'll start with the champion himself, Mr. Novak Djokovic, who managed to win himself a sixth title at the ATP Finals, matching Roger Federer's record that had been long standing for a while. Of course, he won his last one in 2011, I believe. It had been the first one for Djokovic in seven years. Obviously, a long time coming for fans, certainly, but also, you know, pundits can we call ourselves pundits whatever you call us uh, people with a little bit more information on the tours it, it, it definitely surprising that you hadn't won in uh, seven years uh, I think the best place to start would be the final against Casper Ruud but we can kind of flesh it out a bit because, because there's one shot I want to talk about in particular that we talked about a lot on John's channel and talking tennis with Craig O'Shaughnessy because it was the foundation for Djokovic's week certainly against Casper Ruud as well where he wasn't broken the serve just phenomenal throughout the week, right? He only got broken three times. Once against, I always forget who the other person is, Medvedev. Once against Medvedev and twice against Taylor Fritz. And even then against Taylor Fritz, it was two kind of ropey games from Djokovic's end. I always felt like Djokovic had full control over what he was doing on serve, right? And the first thing I want to talk about in that department before I open up to you guys is something Craig mentioned, which is his great sliding serve, not only in the juice court, but particularly in the ad court, because Craig O'Shaughnessy put it so well. He called Djokovic's second serve in the ad court to the forehand a hybrid serve. Not quite a first serve, not quite a second serve, something in between, something that slides away from the forehand and it's got a bit of pace on it. He's just so confident hitting that serve. It bails him out of trouble. For me, that was the shot of the tournament. It was it was great, and hopefully uh, people will, will sort of take that away from, from the tournament and it's fully deserved for Djokovic, right? But uh, yeah, starting with you, John, what were your feelings about it? Maybe mention the serve, whatever you yeah. know about that. And yeah, again. sure. I mean, if your second serve is a hybrid of the first serve, it's pretty neat, right? If, if As long as you're not doing double faults left, right and centre, and he's not. Yeah, so, exactly. And, and, and the, the, the proof is in the pudding, uh, as we say, at least in the UK. I don't know if you say that stateside, Owen. Um, but anyway, the proof is there, basically, um, uh, pudding or otherwise. And uh, yeah, I mean, he, just got, <laughs> he just got broken three times in... In five matches, which is insane. And, and and one of those occasions against Medvedev, and it didn't really matter. A, it was a dead rubber, and B, still went on to win anyway. Um, and, and this is something that's been... It has been building this narrative about his serve, I would say, for two, three, four years now that people have been saying, have you seen Novak serve, by the way, you know? And um, and this this court did lend itself, I think, towards service. I remember even on the opening day, certainly the first match was nothing special. But I mean, in terms of... Uh, from a neutral's perspective, that match between Felix and Casper that started the tournament, I think there was only one break of serve in the whole match. I think there was only one or two break of point break points. And from that moment onwards, we were like, ah, here we go. And and perhaps players like Rafa, as a result, um, who can't necessarily lean on their serve so much, certainly not compared to Novak, uh, although he has made strides over the years, um, explains why. Novak did so well, if you like. Um, I mean, I guess he doesn't. Does, he probably doesn't have quite the same level of speed as as Felix, I suppose, or Taylor. But he's not quite. He's well, more. Do you know, it's similar. It's like one twenty a lot of the time. Okay. But Felix is is probably still a little bit better. It certainly comes in from a, a higher height as well. Um, but yeah, you mentioned people not being aware, of course, of his serve. Even professional players. Just one thing that came to mind there was when Jack Draper played him in the first round of Wimbledon last year right and he came off court and he was like oh my god I, 
I could not believe how good that guy's serve was. Like I could barely touch his service games. And even professional players, you know, they turn up and they're they're sort of flabbergasted by how, how good he is and how great a level you need to bring in that department. Uh, Owen, yeah, open it up to the, the table to you. What, what, what were your feelings about Djokovic this week? Yeah, I mean, I think he was great. Um, we'll get into this later. I thought he screwed himself by playing so hard against Medvedev in the dead rubber, but he recovered from that fine. Um, on the serve, like, I mean, I think it's sort of time to start talking about him as one of the best slash most dominant servers ever, right? Like, I think his serve is in a place where Federer's was in his prime. It's unreadable. Um, it's not super fast, but that doesn't matter if you can't read it. And he's hitting these tiny little spots with it. The second serve is hard to attack. Like, no one's hitting aggressive returns against him. He can one-two punch off either side. He can defend. Um, it's just impossible to get into his serving service games when he's serving well. Um so, like, I, I don't know how you do it. Like, he, I mean, you had that match against Cressy where Cressy won, like, six return points. And, like, that was a bad return performance. But yeah. here you have the top eight players in the world not doing a whole lot better. Like John said, I think the court helped him out. But it's it's scary stuff. It's gotten really, really good. Yeah, I mean, Medvedev's about the only guy that can counter it. And even Medvedev this week was struggling to, to, to hang back on the serves because of how quick the courts were, right? So as soon as the courts get as quick as they can be, Craig called it a medium-fast court, but you know, obviously played quick enough that Medvedev felt like he had to step in and he couldn't quite be as comfortable as he would have liked. Because ordinarily, he's able to neutralise that where 99% of the rest of the tour, in fact, Nobody else uh, can do the same thing as Medvedev, basically, and, and turn it into baseline rally scoring. Can I, yeah, can I just respond to something that Owen said? Uh, it's actually quite brief, but but really important. Is that conversely, in terms of being able to read Novak's serve, he's very good at reading other people's serves. And I know we yeah. go into a different element of the game, but I mean, Novak himself said it in a, in a pretty modest fashion. I think it was after the the win in the final, but it might have been after the Taylor Fritz match, and uh, he just said there was the game that he broke which swung the match very much in his favour. So it was probably either against Casper or it might be against, even against Medvedev, actually. Uh, and he just said, I, I got a good read on his serve in that particular game. And um, yeah, so once you've got a guy who's the best returner of all time, you know, serving unbelievably at the moment and arguably for the last few years, you're in pretty good shape. Yeah, sorry. And it's like, and the reward for returning his serve is like you get to rally with him, and he's one of the best baseliners <laughs> of all time as well. So, like, it's really yeah. tough. There's nothing to attack. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, it must have been the rude one. And it's a nice segue into that match because the, the last game of that first set was by far the most important one of the match for me because it was, you know, 5 all. 6-5, whatever, you know, they were holding serve fairly easily. I mean, Rude had come out of a few sticky situations. Obviously, his forehand, backhand, defence, both wings actually has, has improved tenfold for me, and it's really difficult to finish a point off against him now. He can save himself from pretty difficult situations. And for Djokovic to have to play pretty you know, red-line offence on a Rude service games for the majority of that set, it wasn't proven enough to quite chip down the Norwegian's uh, defences. So in that final game, we didn't see that dynamic unfold. The most important point for me was that set point where a long rally ensued. Djokovic was doing everything he could to batter Rude's backhand, which is meant to have improved, you know, out of sight. He was doing inside-out forehands from very, very odd positions in the court for Djokovic. You know, he was getting himself out of position because he didn't think Rude would go down the line with his backhand. And eventually... Mm -hmm. Rude's backhand goes long and it gives them gives them the point, right? So it just felt inevitable that Djokovic could do whatever he, you know, he liked to test Rude's rally temperament and and maybe come up with uh, cracks in what we thought was a, a weakness that had been covered over. It's just really interesting stuff in the end because we think Rude's backhand has been improved, but in the end against Novak, it's, it's, it's just not, right? Yeah, right. I mean, I, I actually think in that crucial period of the match, the sort of five or ten minutes at the end of the first set when Novak did break to win the first set 7-5 and then he broke really early in, in the second, there were various rallies that I think maybe he went for the slice, he being Casper, and I was thinking mm, he could have gone for a double-hander there. Mind you, he was still getting great depth on it. I think one of the slices I thought was going to go long, but it must have just bounced on the line. But that's not good enough against Novak. Uh, you know, to do a defensive slice that lands so deep doesn't matter. And and I think the words that Craig used yesterday, Craig O'Shaughnessy used yesterday, uh, um, 
I remember watching with you at that point uh, uh, when we were talking about some of these rallies, um, Jack, and uh, I couldn't put it into the words that until Craig used them yesterday, but I was just saying, I don't know why he's just going for the slice there, but he couldn't. And the key was, and Craig said it yesterday, was the ability to turn defense into attack. And I've just been watching quite lengthy parts of the Sinner Alcaraz match at the US Open. Pretty good match, by the way. And um, and the ability of both of those players, by the way, when they're in trouble and you're thinking they just got to hang in there. No, they want to go. They want to go more than that. They don't want to just hang in there. They want to transform this rally. And and Casper couldn't quite do that in the most important moments on Sunday. Very good point, actually. Yeah, we we kind of forget that you know defense to offense is a trait that is among the best players in the game. You know, it's, it's definitely you know Federer, Djokovic, Nadal esque, right? And we don't often see it from Rude a lot of the time from defense, which is what I was talking about earlier. I'm talking about him turning defense to neutral, not the opposite. That I've not. You don't often see Rude come up with a hot shot. That is going to completely change the dynamic of the point, I would say, because of how much spin he puts on it. He, he doesn't quite feel as confident flattening it out. Um, oh, and any other thoughts before I start slandering on Rude too much? No, I, I agree with all of that. And I think I think late in that first set, Rude almost got a little too comfortable defending, if that makes any sense. Like, I think I, I agree with you. I think he's become a great defender. But I felt like he sort of fell into that pattern and sort of forgot that even if you're a great defender, you don't want to be defending, you want to be dictating. And I felt like he sort of thought to himself, oh, you know, Novak's not hitting winners. I can get to a lot of this stuff. Like, I'm just going to get everything back. But it's like, that's not a good game plan because you're not playing points on your terms. Um, And so I felt like in that 6-5 game, it was just a lot of like defending in that backhand corner, trying to slice it back deep. And it's like, you're going to get a lot of forehands back, but you are you might not win those points anyway because Djokovic is relentless on the offense. And um, I felt like that was what happened. I think 30-15, um, long rally ending with a forehand winner, and then set point long rally, Rude defended for most of it, eventually missed a backhand. So, like That's how it's going to end more often than not. So I think he needs to figure out other ways to play those points. Yeah, definitely agree. And and still a good week for Rude for sure. Obviously went one better than last year. We might talk about his year a bit more as we go on, but the the one person I want to focus on at the moment, besides Novak, after what Craig said yesterday, admittedly, because he kind of has changed my perspective on him a little bit, Taylor Fritz's run in this tournament this year, in the semi-final as well, he, you know, Craig said he lost well right it was a very close match it was one of those matches that definitely could have went free obviously had that moment in the second set 5-3 30 all where somebody shouts out from the crowd and he misses the short backhand at the same time you know we'll forget about that point the point is Fritz was in there the whole time and it really wasn't the margins were particularly close you know two tie breaks obviously he is definitely the most improved player of the year for me, I would say, if we kind of take away the obvious Alcaraz, I suppose. Um, Fritz is right up there as the kind of dark horse of the most improved players. And it kind of stems from the movement is one of the things, of course, after the operation, you know, he moves very fluidly around the court. And it, the backhand, it's got to be the backhand. I saw this, the, the ATP rankings thing that they use from Hawkeye data sets, right? And it, it ranks your backhands, your forehands, your serve throughout the week from uh, you know the, the, the eight competitors in the ATP finals. Taylor Fritz was top of the list. And I, I get it. His backhand cross court is money. It's huge. And it, it's possible for him to beat Novak in that cross court dynamic, which is, is, is massive. As soon as you make Novak start hitting the line, uh, down the line with his backhand more often than not you give yourself a chance in a match for sure you know make him scared in that backhand wing and you've got a chance uh, Taylor Fritz in general has impressed me a lot recently and Craig said he's going to have a bigger 2023 than 2022 how do we feel about that? Uh, I'll go for it first I, I, I was um, I was Probably thinking, like for many players at this tournament, actually, I think this tournament was, make or break would be an exaggeration, but it was certainly going to be arguably year-defining, i.e. I think if someone like Tsitsipas or even maybe even Medvedev, you know, wins this tournament, suddenly they're going from a either an average, mediocre or bad year, depending on where you are on the spectrum, to actually having a pretty good year, if you like, because... 
arguably it's the fifth biggest um, tournament on tour, aside from uh, the Olympics when that rolls around every four years. And um, but but Taylor as well, perhaps not necessarily having to win it, but I think let's say he'd have lost all three group matches, you'd have been like, well, this is just a, a level above too much, too far for him, if you like, despite winning in Indian Wells. But um, I don't maybe quite share as much uh, uh, enthusiasm for 2023 as Craig does, but I certainly know where he's coming from in that perhaps after Djokovic in particular, he can take the most from this tournament and he he could well improve next year. And if he's improving next year, that's meaning top five. And there is space in the top five, if you know what I mean, uh, to get in amongst Alcaraz, Djokovic, perhaps Nadal will still be there come this time next year as well, uh, and so on. So, and I understand as well, because probably he pushed Novak maybe more than anyone else. I know you've got the three setter with, with Medvedev, yeah. but it was a dead rubber. And there was, as you said, it was a kind of a strange match, Jack. And and um, Novak was uh, sort of under the weather that day as well. So yeah, I, I, I get it. I, I've still got a question mark, and I'd like to hear what Owen thinks on this, about the temperament in super important moments, in super important matches. I was there at Wimbledon this year in that fifth set. It was there for Taylor if he want, not if he wanted it, but you know what I mean. It was there for him to win. I know Rafa's forehand was unbelievable yeah. that 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 particular set and that day in general, but but it was there for him. I also think that nerves in previous matches when he's gone into five sets at, at, at the Australian Open, perhaps when when he played Novak, but I also think against uh, Medvedev, I think it was this year. And I'm just just wonder about it. I think in this tournament, and I can't remember who said it, but somebody far smarter than me said going into it that that perhaps you know being the eighth guy, if you like. Well, the pressure's off, and yeah. you know perhaps he performed as a result. Owen, what do you think? It's a good question. I so I do think that is the next step for him is like performing in these big moments against Djokovic and Nadal. But I also think it's not a bigger problem for him than it is for anyone else, really. Right? Like, no, no one can do this. I guess you can say Alcaraz did it this year, but no one is as good in the big moments as those two. So, like, if that's his problem, then he's a pretty good player. You know, like I think he has made big strides this year. Um, like you said, Jack, like the backhand has gotten really, really good, which is kind of surreal to see from an American man at this point. Um, the movement is not great, but it's pretty good. Um, the forehand's good. The serve is good. I think the touch could be better. But yeah, he's becoming a really well-rounded player. Um, and I think like his work ethic is there too. Like I get the sense when I watch him that he's going to get farther. Like if not where he wants to go, then close. Um, because like I think his trajectory has been really encouraging. Like, as you say, if, if his problem is not performing in the big moments, it's kind of difficult to point to another weakness because the serve, the forehand, the backhand, even the net play when you need to be clinical, it's it's all it's all there, right? And off of clay, he could do massive things for me. Um, if Because really, it should just be experience that makes him better in those moments. A, a good mentor as well, right? That, that sort of makes him better in the bigger moments. So it's maybe just a matter of time so I kind of get where Craig's coming from right but some players have it I suppose you know some other, others don't and um, some have been trained to get better in those bigger moments and, and it's worked out but I mean Taylor's still pretty young keep that in mind you know he's 23 24 maybe um so plenty yeah. of time ahead of him and, and not just that but this is really his first like elite year so I feel like in terms of playing at the top level he's younger than he is if that makes sense like a couple more years of this and I think he'll really gain experience in that level Definitely. Um, leaving Fritz behind for a second, a bit more on Casper Ruud. What do you guys think? Is it turning into a bit of a mental battle for Ruud? I think, John, you mentioned a sort of inferiority complex potentially could be at play. You know, he respects these guys too much a lot of the time. Ruud has now tallied a Miami final, French Open final, US Open final, ATP finals final this year. The four biggest matches, I guess, of his career, you know, is something going on or is he just always going to be second best in the um, matches? Yeah, I heard a quote from him, or I may have read it on Saturday. Actually, I made a note of it about five minutes ago when we were chatting uh, about Casper. And the, the, the words were, well, I think it was exactly this. I'm going to try to believe for tomorrow. Well, if you're trying, uh, you know, if you're trying to believe it's suggesting, and I think his English is good enough to, to, that's exactly what he meant. You know, it's like, 
I, I mean, hope I can believe. <laughs> uh, and, and I feared at that yeah. point, and we've seen how, uh, and I know it was mentioned on the, on the tennis podcast as well, I think, about how he said something, or they were talking about how he applauded once for a Novak shot that actually went out, and he wasn't trolling Novak. I think he was just oh, sort wow. of too deferential, if you like, to his opponent. And and he is a bit like that with Novak and, of course, we know it with Rafa as well. And, yeah, it's it's not a, you know, you look at the four, fi- uh, so that, um, that's a kind of a negative. And you can also add the four finals. I think you said it was this year that he's lost. Let's put a positive spin on it. He's run into uh, Rafa Nadal on Philippe Chatrier. He ran into Carlos Alcaraz at, in, no, at, no, at, uh, at, well, both, right? Yeah, yeah. Miami, Miami in Miami the US. Right? But let's even just look at Miami. I think he was probably in the best form of, of, of his career, Alcaraz, or certainly the best form he's shown this year, because I know he won the US Open, but it was over a two-week period. And even then, probably wasn't until the Sinner match that he really started to show his best. So as a block of work that he had during that period, I think he won, a, won two clay court tournaments, uh, at least one clay court tournament. I think it was Rio, maybe after the Australian Open. Uh, and he played really well at the Australian Open. He was unlucky in a way not to beat Berrettini. So for about three or four months, I thought Alcaraz is just un- unbelievable. It wasn't until that defeat to Zverev in, in Roland Garros that that period came to an end and periods always come to an end. So anyway, I've, I've gone off track a bit there. But he also then, of course, runs into Novak uh, here at the ATP Tour Finals and, of course, Alcaraz as well at the US Open. So, you know, it's not like he's getting to the finals and he's losing matches that perhaps you'd expect him to win. Um, and he... I think he surprised us in getting to the... He certainly surprised me in getting to the final in Turin. Um, so I guess there are positives. The backhand has improved. The serve has improved. But if he is going to convert some of these finals into wins, he's probably going to have to beat Alcaraz, Nadal or Djokovic because they're, they're going to be there. I mean, yeah, one of them... You, you're going to win a Grand Slam. You can be very lucky to, to win a Grand Slam without having to get past one of those three, I would suggest. Oh, for sure. Yeah, um, to keep us uh, just on track, Owen, I'll, I'm not going to ask for your thoughts on Rude, but I will ask you for your thoughts on the, the next player I'm about to discuss. Andre Rublev, in a similar vein to Kasper Rude, obviously had a decent week, but yeah. like, I can't help feeling that it probably was a bit of a disappointment for him because he's had a lot of big matches in his career, just like Rude again. Not finals all the time, but we're talking six slam quarterfinals, two Masters finals. And now an ATP semi, obviously, again, those players are pretty good. You know, we had Rude at the ATP finals this year, Medvedev, Nadal, Tifo at the US Open, Chilich sits the pass at Roland Garros, Medvedev in Australia. I don't think it really matters who's in the other side of the net. For me, Rublev has underperformed in those matches. I, I, he's barely, I don't have the set count in front of me, but I'm pretty sure he's barely won a set in those matches. In fact, I can't recall one off the top of my head. They might all have been straight sets. Is that? Is, am I right about that? I might be right about that. What, what's it feels this like again? It, Sorry, in what matches? In the, the six Slam quarterfinals, oh, two Masters he, finals, he, and he the got ATP a couple semis of sets in the the Roland Garros quarters against Chilich. Um, but I think that may be the only one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He went to a fifth set um, yeah. tie break, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, that might be it. But it's a good stat, right? And I think in some ways it illustrates the fact that he hasn't improved nearly as much as he would have wanted to. He made his first major quarterfinal in 2017 at the US Open. That's more than five years ago. He's yet to go further than that. Like, I can't put a positive spin on that. Um, You know, that that said this tournament, I think think the way he went out was a disappointment, but I don't think the whole thing was a disappointment. I think the win over Medvedev was fantastic. That's not the kind of match that he tends to win. Um... And I think that got extremely complicated at the end. I think the rally and the way he played that rally on match point was stunning. Um, I think the win over Tsitsipas was very good from a set down. Um, but the semi against Rude, he just didn't really show off, did he? Um, and so I think that one will sting. Yeah, for sure. I mean, would you guys agree with Tsitsipas's comment as well? Maybe that's the reason he's not underperforming, right? He's got a limited tool set. New tools. I, I was hoping we would talk about this. I first want to say about the comment, like, merits aside, I think when you say that after you've lost to this person who you say has few tools, 6-2 in the third, no one's going to take you seriously, and rightfully so. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, yeah, R- Rublev is kind of one-dimensional, right? Like, his forehand is his best shot, but even that is not as good as some other forehands. Um, 
And then you have some pretty serious weaknesses, most no- notably the second serve. Um, if he can't hit through you, that's it. And I think that was illustrated in the Djokovic match. Like, no matter how well he played, he wasn't going to win that. He would have needed Djokovic to just not show off. Yeah, it's funny. I just wanted to see this score in the Jensen Brooksby match against Stefano Tsitsipas earlier this year in <laughs> Miami. It might have been Indian Wales. And again, he lost 6-2 there as well, funnily enough, Owen, in the third set. Yeah, you, you wrote yeah. about that, right? Because Steph said yeah. something similar after that one. Like, he's not... He did. Yeah. <laughs> I think he said something like, he's got no real weapons. Right. He, can't do it. he can't do anything with the ball. <laughs> he's just... <laughs> it's the fact Steph's got history of this sort of thing that yeah. makes this a little bit damning for me. I think Craig said that you'd let him off the hook. He was like, fine, you know, replay. That's one-dimensional, and fair enough. He kind of is. But... I get it. I mean, I, you can't say that after a match. You're right. You're like after you've lost to the guy, I mean, it's just, it's it's damning, yeah. and that's why Steph gets this sort of reputation sometimes for sure. Without uh, talking about Rublev any further, Sits passes the guy that uh, deserves a lot of focus. I feel because this year for him, not just this tournament, has been such a, a strange one. I, I'm pretty sure he still leads the tour for the most wins. I might be wrong about that. You know, he's, he's right up there anyway. But he's had so much disappointment this year with, I believe, five finals uh, having not won. He's coming up against the same guys a lot of the time and he's coming up with the same performances. You look at the Novak one and it felt inevitable that he was going to lose that. He failed to break his serve again for the third time in four matches. Even the Paris Masters one, right, when he when he had a really good match. It still fit ine- inevitable when he played that tie break against him, and then comes up against Rublev and and plays a lot worse than everybody. I think it, everybody right was expecting Steph to win yeah, that one. I was I'm pretty sure. Um, I, mate, I was. Yeah, most people were. Um, Craig O'Shaughnessy said that Steph Sitsabas's backhand is the worst shot in Turin. Oof. <laughs> I I think that's too harsh. Rublev's I would say second serve, harsh. I think, is probably worse. Um, Boom! Yeah, there you go. That's that's a very good point. But, but the fact that it's a candidate makes the point that, like, I get it. Yeah, and also, is it is it more hurtful for for Rublev's you know second serve? It might be worse, but the fact that he doesn't have to play it as much, right? Whereas Steph's backhand can get exposed each and every point in a lot of ways, unless he runs around to his forehand. Uh, it's probably more impactful Steph's backhand, and against players like Djokovic, who he's now lost to nine times in a row. I think it's I think actually, funny enough, and... more than maybe any other player on on the on the ATP tour, certainly any uh, player that I can think of in the top ten, um, maybe Steph divi- Steph's twenty twenty two divides opinion perhaps more than most because I think you can find both narratives if you want to find it. You know the the the, the stat you just came out with with the most tour wins there or thereabouts. It was certainly there for, at some point in September October, and it may well still be there at the end of the season. You can find that, and and that's fine. But you know, if I played a thousand times on the on the ATP tour, I think I might have the most tour wins as well. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm exaggerating, but uh, you know, we, you know, you can. <laughs> it's better to win a tournament and then go out in the first round, if you like, or or, or win a tournament then go out in the second round, yeah, and so yeah. on and so forth, than get to semifinals and finals at at two fifties and five hundreds. But you keep losing them. You you lost in you lost in Rotterdam to Felix. I think it may have been in straight sets actually, and that was don't forget. A, different Felix to today he hadn't won a final yes. until then um going back to the backhand I uh, and, and this is also about expectation and, and how I view his 2022 compared to 2021 because I felt from that quarter final against Rafa at the Australian Open in 2021 from that moment until two sets to love up against Novak at Roland Garros that six months body of work was easily his most impressive and was easy at his best. I mean, he had a match point against Rafa in, in Barcelona as well. You know, he won Monte Carlo uh, and it was a, it was it felt a better Monte Carlo win than the Monte Carlo win of this year when Rafa wasn't there. Novak was a, a shadow of himself for various reasons that we all know about. And, uh, and Alcaraz went out early. So, you know, that all opened up. And for me, a, a, a person... It's like Steph, who you want to see progress on. And back to the backhand, by the way. The backhand against Rafa in that match was really solid. It was unbelievable. I think he even won match point with a backhand down the line. 
And uh, it didn't... Yeah. Okay, the first couple of sets, Rafa was unbelievable. And, you know, Tsitsipas couldn't quite live with Rafa at times, but there's no shame in that. But he certainly more than lived with him for the following three sets. And then all the way through that clay court season, he was insane. And there's just no way. I think somebody, it might have been Nick, was saying he, he's had a good, as good a 2022 or even better than 2021. I don't see that at all. He didn't... I measure... I give Steph a lot of credit. He's an unbelievably... Talent-wise, he is in the top five in the world. And for me, he if you want to be, you know, getting, you know, getting to slam finals, or, or at least that's how I measure him as in terms of his year. So winning Monte Carlo, which he did the year before, but worse than that, uh, Australia fine. If, if you look at the slams, anyone, we talk about par or not reaching par. For me, Australia, if you I would probably say that's about where he should get, but perhaps that win against Sinner was was very impressive. So you maybe will give him. Give him a point. For yeah. That. Oh my God, I it wanted to mention that. Was an incredible that, that win. Win was it was incredible. an incredible win. It was incredible. So I, I like... apologize, but then yeah. uh, Wimbledon, fine. Third round, Kyrgios, fine. But the other two slams are are just off the charts in terms of disappointment for me. Um. Yeah. So I I agree with the vast majority of what you said, John. Like I think people are sort of debating over whether he had a good year or not, and it's like I'll say first of all, like you said, very talented, top five in the world. Um did some good things this year but like do you think he's happy with this year like in in what match has he played has he like exceeded his potential like 2021 you had that win over Nadal from two sets down he did nothing remotely close to that this year I think I think the match against Sinner in Australia was great and I think the wins over Medvedev at the end of this year were good although I don't think Medvedev played that well and besides that it's like what do you point to to say like that was just peak Tsitsipas? You know, like I think his, I think his motivation has been flagging at times. There are times when he doesn't look that interested. Um, I don't think his weaknesses have gotten a whole lot better. I would point to the return of serve as well. Like um, even in the bat- match against Djokovic in Paris, where um the second set he returned really well. I think he broke twice. Um, the other two sets combined, he won like four points on the return. Like it's. Even even when that shot is overperforming, it's still a weakness. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like I, I, I just don't think it was a good year for him. I think he's probably really frustrated right now. I think so as well. Clay's about the only place he looked, you know, as good as Sitsipas could be. Besides that center match, yeah. by the way, because I still think that was his best match he's of the year for me, just relative to performance and surface on Clay. Even then, the loss to Holger Rune still showed that he can be beaten on the backhand side, even on clay. Even though, you know, he's got so much spin on that side, he should have been serving well enough in that match to give himself enough forehands, and he didn't show up at all in that regard. Holger Runa obviously is a great returner. He is obviously a great player and probably will be in the top 10 for years to come. But Steph, as a top five player, deservedly, as we were saying, should have done better, for sure. It was four pretty team sets for me. Uh, and that draw was there. Finalist, that right? draw opened up so much because yeah. because Rafa, I think, had a bad uh, Rome, if you like. That sort of skewed things somewhat. And bad Rome, you know what I mean, because of the foot and losing to Shapovalov. So his ranking yeah. slipped uh, one or two places. And Steph, because he got to the final in Rome, shot up one or two places. And that skewed the draw. So you had Zverev, Rafa, Djokovic and Alcaraz the four players most in form at that point and, and probably going into that tournament thinking will be the semi-finals. Well, they were all on course to meet each other in the quarterfinals. Over on the other side, you had Steph and you're thinking, well, even if Steph's not playing great, how does he not get to this final? Well, he found a way of not getting there. Yeah, yeah, everybody, yeah, you're quite right, John. Everybody felt exactly the same way. <laughs> Steph's sets of pass has definitely been one of the most fascinating topics of the year i would say no wonder we spent spent quite a while on it there i will move us on but oh yeah you could talk about sits the past for days right it's just everything about his year has been really really interesting i'll move on to oh, and i'll frame this in the same way that, that john put it yesterday mevdev rafa within this tournament the atp finals which player should we be more worried about is what we were talking about yesterday Rafa obviously had a pretty disappointing tournament. He just got the one win, and again, it was maybe that inferiority complex from Rude, and the matchup itself obviously isn't great for Rude too. Um, coming to the four, his first two matches fairly disappointing. Medvedev, three tie breaks, the three uh, third set tie breaks. Sorry, the first guy ever to do it at the ATP Finals and lost all of them. Also served for the match in two of those matches, 
and lost both of them. I will point out that he's only ever lost one match prior to this tournament and had having served for the match, and that was against Rafa in 2019 when he served for the match twice from 5-1 up and uh, lost that match. For me, Rafa injured whatever going on, his fa- least favourite surface, indoor hardcourt, not much of a worry, right? This guy could be back next year in Australia rearing to go and play just as well as he did this year. It just feels like he's got that bounce back ability when he's been injured throughout his career. I don't think it's anything to worry about. Daniel Medvedev has had a history of this throughout the year where he's been on top in some matches, or at least not not on top, but just underperforms on serving matches when in years gone by, he looked untouchable in serve in some hardcore matches and his return game would give him a chance in every single other, uh, re- you know, if it was opponent service games throughout the match. And that dynamic was just unplayable for people. It's not felt like that this year at all. It, it feels like his serve is always vulnerable. He's got that double faulting problem. You know, we saw it against Steph in Cincinnati where he, he threw in four at the end of the, the third set and the same with Alex de Menor as well in Paris, you know, at the end of that match almost not throwing away matches, but it kind of feels like that for me. I, I, maybe that's too harsh. Anyway, for me, this is much bigger for Medvedev. And three tight losses feels like his 2022. Oh, sure. I, I was going to say, I, I think Medvedev is an easy answer to this question. I'm I'm very concerned about him. Um, I think if Titi Foss's year has been disappointing, Medvedev's has been worse. Um, and, you know, there are reasons for that. He took a brutal loss in the Australian Open final. He had a hernia. He wasn't allowed to play Wimbledon, probably like wrecked his rhythm. But man, what can you point to this year that you've been impressed with for him? For me, it's like maybe that match against Shapovalov, um, some of his form in Australia before that comeback in the final. Um, and then the rest yeah. just feels like a desert. I mean, and it's not just three tight losses. Like two of them were to Rublev and Tsitsipas, players who he has dominated on hard court until pretty recently. Um I think even against Djokovic, like he served for that, you know, Djokovic is great, but matchup wise doesn't really give Medvedev trouble. You know, he's like you were saying earlier, Jack, Medvedev's kind of the one who can sort through that matchup and just play naturally and not be hurt by it. Um, And at this tournament, Medvedev won two years ago and made the final last year. So expectations are high and he didn't win a match. Um, I think Rafa, this tournament, like this is just how it goes for him. He's not really in rhythm. And he's old. So, like, he's got all the excuses in the world. I don't think Medvedev has any right now. I think the other thing, the only th- reason why you would be more concerned about Rafa going into the following year is I just wrote the word age down. That's the only thing that would, would if, with the question of who are you more concerned about with going into Australia, the only thing with Rafa really is age. Obviously, injuries, but even that is related to his age. But conversely, really, the reason why, for me, it is Medvedev, like Owen said, is just that the length of time. We're talking about 10 months, I don't know, something like that, since that Love 40 moment that we all know about in Australia against against Rafa at two sets of love up. And then since then, uh, I mean, I know Craig said yesterday, well, he got, well, because actually Craig was more positive than, than Jack and I felt, for sure, about Medvedev. Uh, he said, well, he got number one this year. And I wasn't on yeah. the show, if you like. I was backstage and I was just thinking, yeah, but he got that off the back of, 2021 you know he had to earn the world number one status losing i think it was in acapulco to rafa uh, and he was performing a lot worse there than he was in australia maybe rafa does slightly better in acapulco anyway i know he likes going there etc but you know and then from that moment onwards i don't cincinnati semi-finals was probably the tournament he earned most points at um oh well of course australia final but say from australia i guess he didn't earn any more points than a semi-final at Cincinnati, I know he won a couple of 250s or at least one 250. But, um, oh, he won, of course, a 500 as well. You know what I mean, though. But yeah. I guess there was some chinks of light. We thought, oh, hello, maybe winning winning that tournament in, in Vienna. And then also, of course, that was an epic sort of two sets that he had against Mevide- against um, Djokovic. We thought, hang on a second. But I just put the, the brakes on at that point because Jack and I was talking about it on, on this exact pod a few weeks ago. And I just said, look, the only thing is, there hasn't been a a win that either I didn't expect him to win or that he shouldn't win or that it was like insane. You know, he's just beaten Djokovic on a hard court indoor. He may have won that that stand one. We'll never know. But there wasn't like a Rafa win either in there or something like that. So whereas whereas actually we were comparing him to Felix at that point, Felix had actually had a few notable wins in my book. Okay, it was the Labour Cup, but he did beat Djokovic. 
still impressive, I think, whatever way you look at it. He also beat, did he beat Alcaraz somewhere? He certainly beat Holger Runa uh, as well. So there was a few yeah. notable wins in there in my book. Yeah. There just weren't any notable at that juncture, even for, for Medvedev. And what's the run with him now, Jack, in terms of this year and top 10 opponents? Like it's about eight or nine losses in a row. Yeah, eight in a, eight in a row, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, Felix obviously beat Alcaraz twice. Yeah, dude, you're quite right. Um, yeah, it's chalk and cheese for me and... Uh, you're talking about highlights of the year. The highlight for Medvedev was the Australian Open and Medvedev fans around the world probably see that as a disappointment, right? Because he, you know, people say he blew it, whatever, I, you know, it was more raffer for me, but I, it was still a massive achievement to get to that final in the manner that he did. Certainly felt like his form of the US Open the year before. Can I ask, can I ask one of you two a question, if everyone wants to take it? Is there any sort of case of yeah. some people have figured him out? There was a feeling that that halfway through that Australian Open final that maybe Rafa not figured him out because I think he had a, he's obviously got a very good head-to-head -head against him. But in the context of that match alone, there was some sort of moments that Medvedev was caught in no man's land, didn't really know whether to go into the net or go back to the back of the court. And there was sometimes, I remember Rafa winning points and Medvedev was in a kind of weird position having just done a drop shot or something. And um, is there any sense that, that other players on the tour have, figured him out in some way yeah i mean i, I do yeah, think there was a period in you know maybe late 2019 2020 even last year when it seemed like medvedev's game was balanced in a very similar way to djokovic's um and i do feel like that's no longer the case like i think players are now exposing his lack of feel at the net like i think he maybe either that wasn't apparent or he did a better job of covering it up in the past you know like doesn't really have a slice like the serve is kind of lapsing and so now i think players are having an easier time playing him just because they feel like there's something they can do. Like you can pull him forward and he's not going to like hit a winner off a bad drop shot a hundred percent of the time. Um, but I also feel like that's down to like, feel like little leaks in his game has, have sprung this year that maybe didn't exist last year. Yeah. Um, basically saying the same, as you said at the end there one, but yeah, I feel like it's more Medvedev than anybody else for sure. Because there's, there's conditions where people know what to do against Medvedev and there's nothing they can do, right? You know, it's like that the, the game plan would be way too risky to 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 take against Medvedev and win. You see him in Astana playing RBA. Roberto Batista who's beaten Medvedev three times. Four times maybe. Might have that wrong, but either way, he's beaten him a few times. And he goes on to a slow hard court with Medvedev. And he has a game plan to beat him. And there's literally nothing he can do. It's six one, six one. Like, the guy cannot hit through the wall that is Daniel Medvedev. And if he's serving well enough, Medvedev as well, he should be able to cover his serve for days because his serve is great. He's six foot six, for goodness sakes. So the, the guy is unplayable sometimes. And I've not, apart from that yeah. match, by the way, RPA, that match was insane. And that's when I was like, oh, we're, we've seen a spark of something incredible here. We could be seeing Medvedev of old. I haven't felt like that again. And it, Australia... That sort of small streak in Astana, that's been the only two times where I've felt yep. pretty confident about his chances. Right, Medvedev. We've talked, covered him. There's only one other player to talk about, and that is Felix Ogiali Asim, who we did touch on already talking about, you know, two wins against Alcaraz and throughout that streak, of course. Uh, the, the, during that streak, sorry, the Alcaraz wins where that indoor streak was incredible. When Wins three titles on the bounce, Having lost like, you know, nine finals out of 10 prior to that sort of proves everybody wrong. Goes into Paris, maybe a little fatigued and loses to Rune in the semis. And going into here, I expected them to be second favourite. Second favourite, third favourite, up there anyway, for sure. For me, this is a disappointment. The Taylor Fritz match was a little bit tame at the end, sort of 6-2, third set. I'll give you a little bit of Craig's analysis and see if you guys agree with it. First about the serve, actually, the pro. The serve's always going to be good. Statistically, he's got the second best serve on tour for somebody six foot, foot or shorter, right? Six foot four, sorry, or shorter. Other than Kyrgios. Kyrgios is the other guy that, that tops him. His serve is great. He's always going to be able to do that. He's obviously honed it to the point where it's, it's unplayable sometimes, especially in steady conditions. However, Craig mentioned his forehand as still a little bit of a weakness sometimes. He said that it can be ropey. It, it shouldn't be as ropey as it is. You know, he gives himself little to do in the serve plus one and sometimes he still mucks that up. 
during a rally as well, just going for too much. The backhand, of course, you know, we don't need to say too much more about that. It's certainly a rally shot nowadays, but it's not the sort of weapon that is going to sort of hit through anybody in, on the, especially in the top eight of the ATP finals, right? And uh, we saw that against Taylor Fritz, who exposed a few of those weaknesses. And really, it felt it felt very deflating for me. Yeah, I, I somewhat agree with that. I, I found it more of like a Miles disappointment, I guess, because um, I feel like, yeah, he had been in great form. I I kind of figured he I figured he could go three and zero in the group, but you know this was his first World Tour Finals, yeah. right? So I I feel like that's part of it. He had played a lot of tennis, um, and also just his year, um, it had its bad spots, right? Like I think he did a bunch of impressive things, but there were definitely times when he lapsed, like first round yeah. U.S. Open, I think, um, first round Wimbledon or first second round Wimbledon. Yeah. Um, so so I feel like in a way he was almost due for a little bit of a lapse. Um, I think he will get to a point where the consistency is there a little more, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I thought he definitely could have done better, but he's so young and, um, and he played so much tennis this year and like, there's so much ahead of him that, you know, I, I don't know. I was more disappointed. Than yeah. Uh, John Silk, one list. Thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure today. to come on as always. Yeah. Thanks for having us. No worries guys. And everybody else. Thank you for listening this far through. YouTube, like and subscribe, please. Follow us on Twitter, online underscore yep. Jack, at jsilk, at Tennis Nation. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for listening to the Online Tennis Podcast. We'll catch you next time. Cheers.